Kazuo Ishiguro is here. He is considered one of the most important fiction writers of our time. His books include Never Let Me Go and The Remains of the Day, which won the Man Booker Prize in 1989. The Buried Giant is his first novel in 10 years. The New York Times has called it the weirdest, riskiest, and most ambitious thing he's published in his celebrated 33-year career. I am pleased to have him back at this table. Welcome. Nice to be here. Um, congratulations because of the, all that people are saying about this. My question is, um, is, it a, is it about appropriate for you to take 10 years to complete a novel? Well, I would like to do it more quickly, but, I, you know, I'm, I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you know? yes, and there's no, there's no problem with the quantity of books out there, yeah, it seems so, to me. Yeah. Right, you know, so, you know, you're, you're, I, you're going for quality. Well, not, I wouldn't want to say necessarily going for quality, but I would like to, you know, if I put something out there, whether it's, Good or bad, I, I want to slightly change the uh, the landscape. You know, slightly change the skyline of the, the pile of books out there. You know, mm -hmm. um, so whether people like it or not, I, I, I want to offer something a little bit different. So until that gets into place, I, I I don't feel I'm you know I'm ready to put the book out there. You know, some people believe this is a radical departure for you. Yeah, I, it comes as a slight surprise that people think it's so different because I always come at these things from the inside yeah you know, um, I never really I'm a bit like someone's trying to build a kind of like a flying machine you know, before aviation got going you know all these guys used to make kind of funny flying machines in the in their backyards and yeah I'm, I feel like I'm a bit like that I'm, I'm just trying to get this thing that will fly and off you know, for a long time it doesn't fly and I'm putting this piece onto and finally it kind of flies you know yeah. but but I don't really know what it looks like. It may look really weird to someone coming at it fresh. But do you know what it is? Or does it have to be something in your mind? Is it, for example, a love story? It's certainly a love story. I mean, um, I knew that it's a love story. Um, but it's a love story of a certain kind. Because when we say love story, we usually mean a courtship story. Yeah. You know, a story of two people coming together and the story ends when they declare love to each other. This is a kind of a love story. Well, I, I think I think there should be more love stories like this one. You know, it's about the decades, you know, the years. It's the long distance of love. You know, it's about all those years that you you struggle to keep the flame alive. Yeah. And and uh, and this is about you know a, a man and a woman who who are determined to to stand by each other right to the end. So they it's, suffer it's, from a kind of amnesia. Yeah, well, this is this is kind of what I had when I was talking about you know getting my flying machine together. Yeah. I mean, this this was one of the main problems. I I I start off with a kind of a story that I can almost express in two or three lines in the abstract, and I I, I often can't find the right way to put it off, the right setting. And one of the th things I started off with is I want a situation where there's a there's a whole community, a nation suffering mm -hmm. from some kind of selective memory loss. Uh, and and the nation has to decide as a nation. You know, do they want to remember everything? Maybe mm. there's been something very traumatic buried in, in in the recent past, and maybe there was a very good reason for these things being met and being buried. And this. And do you have a point of view on that? I have a, my only point of view is that it's very difficult. Um, it's, it's very difficult to generalize because I think there are situations. Well, let, let, let's take let's take say France yeah. after the Second World War. Yeah, a good example. Okay, I, mean, I don't want to pick on France, no. you know, but I, I'm I'm being polite here. I'm in the United States. I don't want to talk about any buried giants in American society. Sure. I'm, I'm sure you know we can all have, you know, come Absolutely. up with candidates. But I'm being uh, as a matter of etiquette. Yeah. I'm here as a visitor. So, so we'll talk about got, France. We'll talk about France. Yeah, right. Yeah. All right. So that you know, uh, the French after the Second World War. What are they going to do with this stuff? You know, they've they seem to be on the winning side, but they spent a lot of their time collaborating with the Nazis, sending you know French Jews to the to the gas chambers yeah, without yeah. much help from the from the Germans, betraying each other to the Gestapo. Exactly. What do they do with that? You know, how do they move on from that? Maybe there is something to be said, H however outrageous, however unjust it seems, for the position that de Gaulle took to, to say, let's all pretend that we were all brave resistance fighters. And let's just not visit this question for a few decades. Let, there'll be a time perhaps when we're stronger, when we can face this. But right now, if we look at our recent past, we're just gonna tear each other to pieces. We'll go, at least we'll go communist. You know, There might even be civil war. The society cannot hold. 
And and if you look at if you look at situations, say say like um, but this this is what was I suppose the starting point when I started to think about this book. If you think about situations like. Um, uh, uh, what happened in Bosnia in the 90s yeah, and Kosovo and, yeah. or Rwanda there, here or Cambodia have, or Cambodia yeah you have situations here where people seem to have lived together you know, different tribes different communities had managed to coexist yeah. at least for a generation and then some kind of societal memory was deliberately reawakened to mobilize uh, hatred mm. and violence. Do you start with that idea, uh, uh, that situation, and then create characters? Uh, kind of, yeah. I start with that situation, but but the the other thing I, I was very concerned about um, that same question about you know, do we want to remember certain things? Are we better off just keeping some memories buried? Right. I was I was wanting to apply it not just to a nation. But side by side with that, I wanted to apply it to a marriage, hmm. because I think the same questions apply to a marriage, uh, you know, any kind of long distance marriage, hmm. as it would, I guess, to any long term, you know, like parent child relationships, siblings. But that same question arises, you know, because most relationships that go on for for a long time, inevitably there are passages that you agree to just keep buried. Hmm. You know, all right, that was unfortunate. Hmm. Yeah. You know, it was painful. Let's just move on. Let's just move on. But the you know, but the the couple at the centre of my novel they have this very difficult question: um, uh, would, would would our love survive remembering some of these things? Do we want to remember some of the things that we have buried? But on the other hand, if if we don't look at these things and they're, they're, and they sense that their you know their time together is is limited now because they're a certain age. Mm. If we don't look at these darker passages that we've just put to one side for now, is our love genuine? I mean, is it based on something phony? And and I think those same questions, they're very similar to the questions a, a, a larger so family might ask. So individuals have what states have? I think so, yes. Yeah. A sense of yeah. having to... That question, you know, when is it better to remember? When is it better to forget? Is a very difficult one that applies to nations and to... Families and to you, marriages. You, you know what's crazy about this is a scientific aspect of this, and, and and I'm not knowledgeable about it, but I think there are some experimentations going in trying to understand the brain, uh, so that you there are things and drugs that can affect what you remember. You know that can tamper with memory. Hmm. Well, that you see that kind of thing might have been very useful for me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, well, at the stage. I came to a stage, right, because I mean, this is what happens to me as a novelist. I mean, it's not, I, I don't write novels in a sensible order. Right. Yeah, you know, I, I, start, off with a, I start off with a story without a setting. Right? Yes. Uh, now, now, you'd said that to me at a certain point in my, in my kind of attempt to compose this novel. I might have said, oh, that's good. You know, I, I might, that, maybe that's what I need. I'll, I'll go oh. with that as a kind of a, a sci-fi sci-fi-ish yeah. modern kind of device that would give me what I want because I need I need a, a, a situation where everyone has to make that decision do we want uh, yeah. to turn back you know the the force that allows us to forget or actually is it terribly useful do we depend on forgetfulness to to carry on you know, um, and so that's a very good yeah you know, right, what curious, you just I'm, said there is very interesting I mean you know I didn't in the end decided to go down that kind right. of path. I, I decided to go back into some kind of mythical past yeah. where I thought we, I could rely on very ancient kind of storytelling devices mm -hmm. so I could have a kind of a supernatural mist. It's worth invest It's worth looking up. I mean, you'll find out there are lots, a number of things as we explore the brain, uh, as everybody does, and, and, and the academy and science and everybody else. You know, we're finding out interesting things, and that's one aspect of it, of, of, of which there are many. Uh, but memory has been a theme of yours, has it not? Yeah, I, I sometimes worry that it's become a bit of an obsession. Yes, I mean, my, exactly. my, in, my entire <laughs> yes. uh, seems to be <laughs> obsessive memory. Yes. But I think, I, think, I think it's probably changed and evolved over the years, you know, because when I started to write fiction as a very young man, I, I, I think it was, it was in order to remember yeah, I, I I think that's why there's a very intimate link in my in my mind and in my heart, you know, between 
writing fiction and remembering, you know, because now, I was, How does writing fiction catalyze or stimulate memory? Well, it's, it's not so much to stimulate memory. I, I had left Japan at the age of five to live in Britain. Mm. And I think all the way through my growing up, I had these memories of this place that was very precious to me. And it, and it was the place I thought I was going to return to at some point. I had these memories, and it wasn't like a specific series of memories. It was like a memory of a whole world, a whole kind of way of being, a whole, mm -hmm. whole life and a whole atmosphere and a whole group of people. And I, as I got older, I realized that that very, that very personal Japan that was inside my head uh, was somewhere I couldn't go to in a plane. And it was also fading with every year that I got older. And so I think I started off my whole writing fiction career uh, by actually wanting to preserve these memories. And, you know, I, I, I couldn't preserve them just by writing down mm. facts. I had to actually rebuild mm. the Japan of my imagination and memory in a book. So I think, I think right at the foundation of my writing impulse was this notion that um, creating a world in fiction was an act of memory, so memory preservation. So I could say, actually, now you know, it's safe inside that book. My I, Japan is I have to call on my memory to, to, to inform my book. Am I right about that? You know, it's, your memory it, is yeah. going to have to influence the setting and character development. I didn't really even have to call on my memory. It's almost like it's, I've got oh. this, I've got this world that I have built in my head naturally, not because I'm trying to write a novel, but you know, naturally, as a kid growing up, this this world builds up in my head. It's a mixture of imagination, speculation, and memory. And then as I get to a certain age, what am I going to do with it? You know, do I let it just disappear as, uh, as the time goes on? Uh, if it's a very special place and only I have access to it, you know, I want to actually get it down in some kind of way. And I think that was the original impulse. You know, I want to build, I want to preserve it inside a fictional world. And, and so that, that's how it started. And then I think as I kind of carried on writing, I, I never lost that fundamental idea that there's something there's some that you know writing is something about memory and I started to look at other people or, or other characters in some depth but I, I always tended to tell my stories through memory you know people remembering about themselves people putting a memory from 30 years back to right next to a memory from five or ten minutes ago or you know two days ago mm. and 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 trying to assess these memories. You know, are the memories accurate? Are they they're blurred at the edges? Are, are they being distorted by the person remembering the thing? I mean, it's, it's a way of constructing a sense of oneself. Mm. Yeah. And what was the impact of that 14th century um, poem called Sir Gawain and the Green Knight? Not, not a huge amount, okay? I mean, most of that poem, I mean, maybe ma many people watching now know it. Um, mm. It's a very entertaining story. It's a story poem. Right. Most of it isn't particularly relevant to my novel, but although I recommend people read it because it's a very entertaining yeah. poem. But, but um, I took, there was just one little stanza. It, it, you know, the story takes place in two castles, right. Right. but there's a little literally like something like a bridge passage where the young Sir Gawain rides from one castle to the other castle and you get a little glimpse of what Britain was like back in those days and and the anonymous poet says you know it's a hell of a place you know this this young man he, there were no inns or anything in those days so he had to kind of sleep on rocks in the pouring rain you know I, I don't know why he had to sleep on rocks well, you know, he should sleep under a tree or something but he slept on rocks and and then you don't know why well, I, but it said what it, what really struck me was that it, it says in, in the next couple of lines it says something like and I, I'm paraphrasing it says you know he he was chased by wild boar by wolves and panting ogres would chase him up hills out of villages mm -hmm. and then then the story just continues he goes to another castle and it continues in some splendor you know but this little glimpse of this weird imaginary ancient Britain I mean it, just those few lines sparked off a whole world for me and I thought what well, that that would be a fun place to put down my novel you know um, I, I could suddenly see this 
very inhospitable place. Yeah, that's I, a pretty good place. To, when you find that, you know, that's a huge benefit. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. Um, you, and you, that this happens. Some, you, I go location hunting for, you know, because as I told you, I, I, I go about things backwards. It's a stupid way to write novels. Right. But, you know, I, I get a story and I don't have a location. I don't have a setting. And, yeah. uh, and, and sometimes, you know, you ask why, why 10 years. So sometimes it takes a long time to find the right setting. Yeah. But sometimes How long did it take you to find the setting in this case? Well, it it it, it took a long time. Yeah, so yeah, I, was, I did actually think about sci-fi settings, the galaxy yeah. far away, and all this kind of thing. Right. And never, but you know, that's what happens. So, sometimes you come across something, and just a few lines sparks of a whole world like that. You know, and, and I, I particularly liked the the banality of the panting ogres like they you know the there's banality. No, yeah, there was no surprise. You know, the, the the poem doesn't say, and and you know what there were. There were ogres. It's not, no, no. It's just, and, and you know, it's a nuisance. These ogres, you know, made made life very inconvenient. As though they were like, you know, not very friendly bulls that you encounter when you're walking across a farm field. I mean, that's the way it's treated. So, so I thought, well, I, I'll have that. You know, in my world, there will just be ordinary things in the background. It is said that your wife, when she first read the book, hated it. Is that fair? Ah, this this is what this is what you're getting at when you wanted to know what, why it took ten years. I, I, I see. I'm, I'm giving these very serious <laughs> literary responses. You want you want the simple <laughs> human no. answer? No, no, you're right. No, she didn't hate it. <laughs> she didn't hate it. Now, for encouragement, yeah, you know, I'd done a lot of work. I'd found the setting. You know, I, yeah. I'd worked everything out. So I'm quite a long way into it right. by the time I write the prose. Right. You know, I, I I'd written about sixty or seventy pages, yes. and I thought. Yeah, I, 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 you know, even I, you know, sometimes, although I usually work alone, I, I need a little bit, bit of encouragement, yes. like everybody else. Right. So I thought my, my, my wife Lorna would give it to me. You know? Yes. So I, I showed it to her, and uh, she said, um, mm, she said, you know, it's a, you're going to have to just start again from scratch. <laughs> yeah. And I, 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 so I, And how was that moment between the two of you? Well, it was a little bit awkward, but but I, I have I, to start over from the scratch. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what what she's saying is that you know she was saying that I, no, I'm she's saying I'm I'm not saying you, you have to alter this character or change a little bit. Yeah, you know, not a word of this yeah. can survive. You know, but she did say you know you don't have to abandon this idea. She said this, the the concepts, the ideas are, are very interesting. But, but you have to start over. Yeah, yeah. Not a word. I mean, the execution is all wrong. You're going to have to start from scratch, and so. But I, I don't mind this too much, you know, because I... Did you take it seriously? I, yeah, I did take it seriously. I put, I put it to one side. I wrote, I wrote a, another book. I wrote right. a book of linked short stories right. called Nocturnes. I had a couple of movies to worry about. Right. Uh, I, I wrote some song lyrics for, for the jazz singer Stacey Kent. I did these other things. And then, but I always knew I'd come back to this. I, I, this happens to me a lot. Never Let Me Go, I had to attempt three times. Uh, yeah. There are two abandoned versions of that book back in the 90s. And, and so now I've got to a stage where... But they build on each other, don't they? I mean, they you, build on each other. You, know, you didn't just abandon mm. it. You didn't throw it in the ocean. No, you, no, I never actually abandoned it. I never abandoned anything, actually. And, and because I had this kind of strange, maybe a naive confidence that you know, if I come back to it, some, something that was wrong before w w would have gone away. And uh, there will be a solution that hadn't occurred to me mm. you know, first time round, second time round. That would present itself, and that's been my experience. You know, um, never let me go. It was only the third time round mm. that I came ac upon the, the, the what you might call the sci-fi conceit that this should be a story about young people who had actually been harvested as clones for yeah. organ donation. That wasn't there in my first two attempts. I was trying very hard to contrive some way in which young people could go through the experience of old people. You know, that, you know, that they could go through the struggles of the whole thing of becoming middle-aged and then old and then getting sick and dying and asking all the questions that people do over a larger lifespan. Mm -hmm. I wanted to find some way in which they could do this in like, you know, 28, 30 years, you know. And I just couldn't do that, do it before. But um, then, a, you know, a, this jigsaw, piece of the jigsaw presented itself. If you could have been a great musician... Would you prefer that to a great novelist? Well, that's a very difficult question. Um, because? Uh, because I still love music. And, of course, when you're, when you're not allowed to do something, you know, because you know, I wanted to be a... 
not really a musician. I wanted to be a great songwriter. Yes. Yeah, I love songs, you know. Not a composer, that's too grand. I love, you know, like the three-minute, four-minute, you know, two-minute song. You know, a, a, a beautiful emotion or world contained just in, you know, in, in, in a song with all these dimensions, lyrics, performance, the music, the orchestration. You know, I, I think a song is a... So it was a wonderful thing. If I could have been a songwriter, yeah. you know, I, 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 I might, I might swap it. But I mean, <laughs> I, I, but a, a novelist isn't a, isn't a bad no, thing. It, it, just, it, it just, it just, it takes ten years to write a novel rather than you know. Why does it have to, to be either or? Because it, they're both so demanding. It doesn't have to be either or in theory, but in in practice, I'm I'm not a very good songwriter. You know. Um, oh, you know. Um, I you, think if I'm you're not, a great writer, you know whether you're a good songwriter or not. I think I'm I'm not a bad lyricist, but but you know I work with uh, Jim Tomlinson, the uh, Stacey Kent's uh, band leader and saxophonist and husband, and yes. he writes all the music. I mean, um, I guess also as I've got older, as I got older, you know, when I was in my mid twenties, when I moved from songs to short fiction to novels, I I started to feel that there were certain things I wanted to do that I couldn't do in in song. But nevertheless, I think, I think many of the things that mark me as a novelist today—my style, my priorities—they they derive directly from from my decisions that I made about songwriting. You know, I think in somewhere somewhere in the back of my head, I, I'm still writing a song. This is why I like first-person narratives so much. You know, that they're, they're somewhere I think a novel. Like never let me go or remains the day. They're, they're like songs. It's just one songs. Not not like big band songs. They're like you know something like a guy with an acoustic guitar, you know, yeah. or a woman with an acoustic guitar singing to about seventeen people in a in a New that, York that's coffee in house. Your mind. Yeah, that's kind of in my mind. I want that kind of intimate thing, that kind, of, kind of almost like a confessional thing. Somebody is sing, telling the story of their life. Um, to a small audience in an intimate setting. That, you know, that's why I love a certain kind of first-person narrative. You know? Can you play a co an acoustic guitar? I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a not, not a bad um, not guitarist. A bad yeah, I can play in many styles, you know, jazz, folk. Um, I can play in weird tunings, <laughs> blues. Um, I can play bad piano. But, um, it, but as I say, I'm not interested in being... Well, I, I wouldn't mind being Eric Clapton or B.B. King, but it's not that kind of guitar. I, for yeah. me... A, a guitar is something that helps pin down a song. You know, they, it's it's a good instrument for songs because it holds down rhythm, harmony, and melody at the same time. It's it's a great accompanying instrument for a song. You know, what's interesting about the conversation uh, and the guitar, in the guitar and, and lyrics and songwriting and music, um, is I have a friend who is a brilliant writer. He has a son. And his son has been almost a prodigy at a series of things, uh, really good at uh, chess, um, games, um, and things like that. He now is in college and has become obsessed, which happened right before he went to college, with a guitar. And I thought, well, gee, that's a strange thing to be obsessed with a guitar having done and been excelled in so many things. Mm -hmm. and, and you help me understand it. It's the complexity of it all that, that gives you a great well, challenge. Yeah, well, I don't know what kind of guitar is interested in, but there's something about the I guitar. Okay, go ahead. There's something about a guitar that it, it just implies. It, it implies all the other stuff. You know, it implies a whole orchestra. Yes. Yeah, you know, it, it's a very good instrument for that. There's something about a piano that it's almost like a substitute for an orchestra, whereas a guitar, just six strings, it it has to just simply imply. You know, it, it's 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 like a little tiny brushwork. You know, one of those Japanese brushwork things. You know, a few little lines that it implies a whole world, or like a haiku. Uh, and so that's the. I think that maybe your friend's son, maybe that's what he finds fascinating. You know, j j you just you just arrange a few little chords, a few harmonies in this kind of way, and and suddenly it implies a whole kind of orchestration. It's great to have you here. It's lovely to be back. As Thank always. You. The Berry Giant is the title of the novel Kazuo Ishiguro. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.